the daisies covered the country lane. Before homosexuals began starring in their own real-life drama, that ever-popular tale known as Coming Out, the true stories of gay life had to dress themselves up in heterosexual clothing, straight jackets. Small wonder, homosexuality was officially banned from the stage. Perversely, repression made for great art and great artists. Oscar Wilde, Noel Coward, Terence Rattigan, Tennessee Williams, Joe Orton. Theatre was their chosen haven, but all had to play the game of dressing up, adopting roles, subterfuge, pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it were either. The importance of being earnest, private lives, a streetcar named Desire, the deep blue sea, what the butler saw. I must be a boy. I like girls. Can't quite follow the reasoning there. Each playwright found his own way to comment on love, sex and marriage. Each used his advantage as an outsider to smuggle in his own message about heterosexual mores, suitably disguised. And not once does a recognisably gay man appear on stage. Curtain up. Unnatural Act One. The gay comic style that was to become so influential in the 20th century was forged by Oscar Wilde at the end of the 19th. Wilde was trying to laugh certain ideas out of public consciousness. He didn't succeed. In fact, he paid a huge price for that. But his goal clearly was to tease the received opinion of the culture. If you're watching Lady Windermere's fan or The Ideal Husband as uh, someone who's completely ignorant of gay culture, then you'd think it's perfectly straightforward play about the mayhem of adultery and uh, vexed questions of mislaid children. If you're a queen, you go, this is just the most brilliant expose of how everyone in London is running around lying through their teeth about absolutely everything, and no one either notices or cares. Oscar Wilde got married. All Englishmen got married, whatever they get on the side. They all shared uh, the same plight, um, uh, whether they be heterosexual and philandering with a mistress on the side or a master on the side. The Englishman writing would certainly be led to see the hypocrisy in marriage, to see that we are all forced into strange social roles by this institution. All Wilde's great comic plays revolve around secrets kept and secrets discovered, including the most famous. Despite its title, The Importance of Being Earnest is actually about the importance of turning life into art or at least high comedy. In order to get up to town, I have always pretended to have a younger brother by the name of Ernest, who lives in the Albany and gets into the most dreadful scrapes. That, my dear Algy, is the whole truth, pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it were either, and modern literature a complete impossibility. That wouldn't be at all a bad thing. Wilde's subtitle for The Importance of Being Earnest, a trivial comedy for serious people, um, by which he suggests immediately that there are two completely different ways of reading any given work of entertainment. You could read the surface, or you could read what lies below the surface. What you really are is a bumbrist. I was quite right in saying you were a bumbrist. You are one of the most advanced bumbrists I know. What on earth do you mean? 
You have invented a very useful younger brother called Ernest in order that you may be able to come up to town as often as you like. I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bunbury in order that I may be able to go down into the country whenever I choose. There's a whole set of double meanings that you can find about people pretending to be what they're not, about uh, young men avoiding marriage, about um, their relationships with each other, their secret liaison. Any, uh, quote, gay person of that era knew exactly what Oscar Wilde was talking about. I can't believe they didn't. He was enjoying himself, and the audience was too. Those not in the know were enjoying the play on another level. It was a way of masking and admitting at the same time, which is the game, that is the style, that is the camp style at its best, and which makes it so wonderful as theater, because there's a mystery in it uh, that doesn't uh, announce itself, and you have to solve it as the audience. You have to get the feeling under it. To the cynical ear, bunburying sounds a great deal like cruising, picking up men. To the crude ear, it sounds like plain buggery. It's probably both. The point is that each practice must be kept from the sight of the straight world. Now that I know you to be a confirmed Bunburyist, I naturally want to talk to you about Bunburying. I want to tell you the rules. I am not a Bunburyist at all. If Gwendolyn accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. Indeed, I think I'll kill him in any case. Cicely is a little too much interested in him. It's rather a bore. So I'm going to get rid of Ernest. And I strongly advise you to do the same with Mr... with your invalid friend who has the absurd name. Nothing will induce me to part with Bunbury. And if you ever get married, which seems to me extremely problematic, you'll be very glad to know Bunbury. A man who marries without knowing Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. At that is nonsense. If I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, and she is the only girl I ever met in my life that I would marry, then I certainly won't want to know Bunbury. Then your wife will. You don't seem to realise that in married life, three is company and two is none. That, my dear young friend, is the theory that the corrupt French drama has been propounding for the last 50 years. Yes, and the happy English home has proved in half the time. He teases the whole notion of fidelity by making people laugh at the very thing that they would find um, repellent, and thus try creating a kind of, at least imaginative, tolerance for an idea that was unacceptable to them, you know, which is what the solvent of laughter always does, of great laughter. It makes the, uh, the uh, unacceptable irresistible. These great dramas are a classic instance of tro what I call Trojan horse art, where in full view of the audience, with the audience's, I think, often complicity, you smuggle into the most respectable of art forms all of those nasty little secrets which we don't want to hear talked about, except, of course, when we go to the theatre. Having flirted with being found out, Wilde eventually was. His fate sent a powerful message to gay men disappear. Homosexuality went deeper underground than ever before. Only with the arrival of the Jazz Age in the 20s did it dare peek out again. It would take a coward to show courage employing Oscar Wilde's favoured devices of wit, boldness and deadpan style. Noel Coward was the master of getting away with it. The British public seems still to have been very anxious about foppishness and effeminacy and all those things that Wilde, we now know from biographers and critics, sort of tied to homosexuality that weren't tied to homosexuality before. Coward picked all the, up all that stuff and made it work for himself. Pretty boys, witty boys, two, 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 lazy to fight stagnation. Aspiring young author, no coward. To pursue sensation. The portals of society are always opened wide. The world our eccentricity condones. 
A note of quaint variety we're certain to provide. We dress in very decorative tones. Faded boys, jaded boys, womankind. What the dandy wants, what Coward wanted as well, was he wanted to be a rebel, but he also wanted to be accepted in the mainstream on his own terms. In order to distinguish us from less enlightened minds, we all wear a green carnation. Coward once told Cecil Beaton, who was very effeminate in his behavior, that he should watch how he dressed, how he talked. Even a, a handkerchief in the wrong place could expose you to danger. I watch my image like a hawk, he said. What was out there was danger, and it had to be defeated by style. Coward could, safely, voice his defiance of the heterosexual world by putting his words into the mouth of a stylish woman without them sounding too out of place. Larita Whittaker is a fast piece with a sexual past who shrugs off society's judgment that she is a woman of easy virtue. at your mercy completely, but you're too silly to take advantage of it. You choose the wrong tactics. We're certainly not experienced in dealing with women of your sort, if that's what you mean. It is what I mean, entirely. I'm completely outside the bounds of your understanding in every way. And yet I know you, Marion, through and through, far better than you know yourself. You're a pitiful figure. There are thousands like you, victims of convention and upbringing. All your life you've ground down perfectly natural sex impulses until your mind has become a morass of inhibitions. Your repression has run into the usual channels of religious hysteria. You've played physical purity too high and mental purity not high enough, and you'll be a miserable woman till the end of your days unless you redress the balance. You're revolting. Horrible. There's always this representative of conventional morality who is made a total buffoon in the process of the play. And you can say, well, on one hand, that's Coward doing his kind of uh, youth culture, rebellious 1920s uh, uh, shtick, which is part of what Coward was and how Coward was read. But on the other hand, it's always hitting the straight guy. Howard's most famous play, Private Lives, is about pretense. So let's pretend it's actually about two gay men who have to hide what they feel for each other and will always feel for each other by marrying partners who provide a further level of camouflage. Today, such partners would be called beards or walkers. Back then, they were called husband and wife. Mr. and Mrs. Elliot Chase. God pity the poor girl. Are you in love with him? Of course. How funny. I don't see anything particularly funny about it. You're in love with yours, aren't you? Certainly. There you are, then. There we both are, then. What's she like? Fair, very pretty. Plays the piano beautifully. Very comforting. How's yours? I don't want to discuss him. Well, it doesn't matter. He'll probably come popping out in a minute and I shall see for myself. Does he know I'm here? Yes, I told him. Well, that's going to make things a whole lot easier. You needn't be frightened. He won't hurt you. If he comes near me, I'll scream the place down. Elliot and Amanda's new spouses, Victor and Sybil, are not derided merely for the sin of being dull, but for their unquestioning allegiance to being a real man and a perfect lady. Victor and Sybil play their roles, Elliot and Amanda play with their roles. Noel Coward, he's far more interested in the pursuit of a freer notion of sexuality that's actually based more upon 
whether you're smart or clever. Elliot and Amanda are both projections of Noel Coward. Have you known her long? About four months. We met on a house party in Norfolk. Very flat in Norfolk. There's no need to be unpleasant. But was no reflection on her unless, of course, she made it flatter. Your voice takes on an acid quality every time you mention her. I swear I'll never mention her again. Good. Now keep off yours. Thank you. Not at all. As a playwright, and more importantly as a gay man, Coward knew he had to weigh every word. So he doubly valued their meaning. And double meanings. For him, language is a decoy to the feeling underneath. And once you get the trick of that, uh, it's even more affecting than it would be otherwise because of this sort of gauze curtain of words over something very true and real underneath. In Private Lives, Amanda and Elliot discuss how they would feel if the other one died first. And um, admittedly, it's the prelude to an escalating series of rows, but it's extraordinarily poignant while it goes on. Do we always want to bicker and fight? No, that desire will fade, along with our passion. Oh, dear. Should we like that? It all depends on how well we've played. If one of us dies, does the one that's left still love? Yes, yes, with all this might. That's serious enough, isn't it? No. No, it isn't. Death's very laughable. Such a cunning little mystery. All done with mirrors. Darling, I believe you're talking nonsense. So is everyone else in the long run. Let's be superficial and pity the poor philosophers. Let's blow trumpets and squeakers and enjoy the party as much as we can. Like very small, quite idiotic school children. Let's savour the delight of the moment. Come and kiss me, darling. Before your body rots and worms pop in and out of your eye sockets. Elliot, worms don't pop. I don't mind what, you see. You can paint yourself bright green all over and dance naked through the Place Vendôme and rush off madly with all the men in the world and I shan't say a word. As long as you love me best. Coward's own real feelings were amassed in a very particular argument which comes up in private lives and comes up again and again in, uh, in other plays. That is frivolity. Whenever you hear Coward talk about frivolity, you know, let's be frivolous, let's, you know, toot horns and kick up your heels and hard shoulder life. That is the camp position. The refusal to suffer, to embrace frivolity as a sort of a, a lifestyle. What he's really trying to do is turn back on the audience who would shame him with the weight of their judgment. He is turning that weight back on them and refusing it. That's what all comedy does. It, it shifts the responsibility back to the audience. It, it says, I'm not having this. You carry it. But when the marvelous part is over, there is an inevitable time for reflection and possibly regret. Coward insisted that the central character of his 1966 play, A Song at Twilight, was based on Somerset Maugham. But the sentiments expressed seem to apply to another writer who successfully suppressed all public knowledge of his homosexuality. Coward himself. When an ex-girlfriend threatens to publish his incriminating letters to the love of his life, a man, the internationally famous author Hugo Latimer fears that his reputation will be destroyed. Do you seriously believe that now, today, in the middle of the 20th century, the sales of your books would diminish if the reading public discovered you were sexually abnormal? My private inclinations are not the concern of my reading public. I have no urge to martyr my reputation for the sake of self-indulgent exhibitionism. 
Even that might be better than vitiating your considerable talent by dishonesty. Really, Carlotta? Coward also paid the price uh, uh, for this dissimulation of the, the camp style. In his case, he played the heterosexual and performed that and hid behind that and refused for so long to admit any part of the gay world he enjoyed from the beginning of his life. It's a cliché, of course. Gay men are meant to be drawn to the abstract realm of theatre, where entire worlds can be invented and the self reinvented. You could call them drama queens, or instead, see the good sense of Blanche Dubois' simple assertion. I don't want realism. I want magic. In 1954, the British writer John Van Druten's Bell Book and Candle, about a family of witches, was a hit on both sides of the Atlantic. It became a particular favourite with New York's gay audience. It's unavoidable not to see this as a line-for-line line switching over of the metaphor of being gay to being a witch. They live in Greenwich Village, they go after special nightclubs in the village where people don't really know about, you have to be let in by, by like special people. Gillian's aunt is named Aunt Queenie. I sit in the underground sometimes, or in the buses, and I look at the people next to me and I think, what would you say if I told you I was a witch? And I know they wouldn't believe it, they just wouldn't believe it. And I giggle and giggle to myself. Presumably the bulk of the audiences didn't come out of the place saying, well, this is about being a homosexual, I guess. And yet there's absolutely nothing in the play that would lead you to... I mean, it's, it's almost a one-for-one -one correspondence. Sometimes I think you're ashamed of being what you are. Ashamed? I'm not in the least ashamed. Oh, yes, you are. And you're ashamed of Nicky, your own brother. Why else wouldn't you let him live here? Because I can't trust him either. Or his sense of humour his taste in practical jokes. It isn't a case of being ashamed, but... Aunt Queenie, don't you ever wish you weren't? No. Just like all those other people you sit next to in the buses. Ordinary and humdrum? No, I was. For years before I came into it. Well, you came in late. You know how old I was. Three and I don't hanker after it all the time, just sometimes. Oh, darling, you're depressed. I know. I expect it's Christmas. It affects a lot of us like that. Wit and playfulness are but one aspect of the gay style. Deeper emotions were also explored. Passion and how it takes us and leaves us is integral to gay writing. Terence Rattigan is perhaps passion's most eloquent spokesman. His exploration of the erotic in a rigid and very English era made him the most commercially successful playwright of the 40s and 50s. The most fascinating thing about Rattigan's plays is how much sex there is in them. It is an astonishing amount. Line after line, if you read them again and if you look at them carefully, is redolent of sexual desire, sexual lust, unrequited sexual lust, an extraordinary barrage of sex comes flooding across the footlights. Rattigan took the particular circumstances of his own life and transformed them into universal stories for all. A love affair that ended in tragedy inspired the deep blue sea. There was this young actor, Kenneth Morgan. Terry was in love with him, I would say. Morgan fell in love with somebody else, and this person left him. 
Kenneth Morgan killed himself. And this had a great effect on Terry and was the genesis of the Deep Blue Sea. Hester Collier has left her husband and her comfortable home in Eaton Square, where Rattigan himself lived, for a penniless young man with whom she shares a flat in Lambert Grove, where Morgan moved to after spurning Rattigan. When Hester realises that her lover has lost interest in the affair, she attempts suicide. Something he does not yet know. Come on now, there's no more sulks, please. Said I'm sorry, I can't say more, can I? No, you can't say more. Come on now, give us a shot of those gorgeous orbs. Haven't seen them for two whole days. This is me. Freddie Page, remember? I remember. <laughs> Naughty to sulk with your Freddie. She is the daughter of some, I think, a parson or something, and brought up in a respectable uh, English middle-class way, and marries a very pleasant chap. And I don't suppose the sex was all that uh, really very uh, exciting or interesting. And she suddenly becomes conscious of what sexual fulfilment can be. And she's avid for it, much too avid for the poor chap, who doesn't want to deliver up as often as she wants it, to be quite honest. She knows he's inappropriate, she knows he's never going to stay, she knows he's unreliable, but she is completely besotted. The most important word in Rattigan when it comes to passion is danger. It is the danger of Hester's relationship with Freddie that drives it. Hester's husband offers her one last chance for reconciliation and respectability. Hester. Yes. It doesn't matter. The question I was going to ask you is too big to put into a single sentence. Perhaps the answer could be put into a single word. We might disagree on the choice of that word. I don't expect so. There are polite words and impolite words. They all add up to the same emotion. What were you angry with Paige about? Oh, lots of things. Always the same things. What? That word we were talking about just now. Shall we call it love? It saves us a lot of trouble. You said just now his feelings for you hadn't changed. They haven't, Bill. They couldn't, you see. Zero minus zero is still zero. How long have you known this? From the beginning. But you told me. I don't know what I told you, Bill. If I lied, I'm sorry. You must blame my conventional upbringing. You see... I was brought up to think that in a case of this kind, it's more proper for it to be the man who does the loving. But how, in the name of reason, could you have gone on loving a man who, by your own confession, can give you nothing in return? Oh, but he can give me something in return, and even does, from time to time. What? Himself. What you find in Rattigan's plays is a very strong sense of social threat. Sexual scandal or any sort of scandal or any sort of disgrace is a route by which you lose your place in a middle or upper class society. For middle class white gay men um, in the 50s, that was a very, very real threat. A passion in uh, Rattigan was considered dangerous, threatening, explosive, 
it could destabilize life. All these things have to do with Rattigan's own homosexual fear of being exposed. Rattigan himself argued that emotion unspoken gains in power. What is held back not only moves the audience, but moves the audience forward. Dealing always in the unsaid is one of the Rattigan hallmarks. Take the desire for concealment away from Rattigan. In other words, take him out of the closet and you do not have such a successful playwright. Homosexuality is a ghostly presence in the work of Coward and Rattigan up until the 1950s. In America, Tennessee Williams was pulling off the remarkable trick of bringing the subject out into the open. In the 1940s, a new brand of poetry was brought to the plain speaking American theatre by Tennessee Williams. Poetry, an sultry southern fried eroticism, audiences thrilled to and were shocked by. Williams brought to the stage more of a sense of sexuality than the stage was used to. And in the process of doing that, though, he widened into all areas of sexuality. And that's where he was different even than some of the novelists, that he was more aware of, of that if you're going to talk about heterosexuality, you got to talk about homosexuality. Some way, it's got to be there. Desire is fluid and amorphous. Desire can go in any kind of direction. Williams' most famous play, A Streetcar Named Desire, is about precisely that. Desire. Heterosexual desire, certainly, but below the surface, homosexual desire too. While there are no gay characters on stage, there is the smouldering, hyper-masculine presence of Marlon Brando as the rough trade icon, Stanley Kowalski. Williams had drawn a new kind of gay fantasy figure for the modern age. It was a welcome change from the old stereotype. Blanche Dubois' gay husband, Alan, safely dead, safely secreted away in the wings. When I was 16, I made the discovery. Love. All at once and much, much too completely. It was like he suddenly turned a blinding light on something that had always been half in shadow. That's how it struck the world for me. But I was unlucky. Deluded. There was something different about the boy. The nervousness, the softness and tenderness, which wasn't like a man's. Although he wasn't the least bit effeminate looking, still that thing was there. He came to me for help. I didn't know that. I didn't find out anything till after our marriage, when we'd run away and come back. And all I knew was that I'd failed him in some mysterious way and wasn't able to give him the help he needed, but couldn't speak of. He was in the quicksand, clutching at me, but I wasn't holding him out. I, I was slipping in with him. I didn't know that. I didn't know anything except that I loved him unendurably, but without being able to help him or myself. Then I found out, in the worst of all possible ways, by coming suddenly into a room that I thought was empty, which wasn't empty, but had two people in it. There's always this gay character somewhere, usually dead 
or on the end of a telephone. Usually he's committed suicide, but he's driven that wedge in because that gay character is always the crux of the plot. Afterwards, we pretended that nothing had been discovered. Yes, the three of us drove out to Moonlight Casino, very drunk and laughing all the way. We danced in the Vesuviana. And suddenly, in the middle of the dance, the boy I'd married broke away from me and ran out of the casino. A few minutes later, a shot. I ran out. All did. All ran and gathered about the terrible thing at the edge of the lake. I couldn't get near for the crowd, and, and somebody caught my arm. Don't go any closer. Come back. You don't want to see. See? See what? Then I heard voices say, Alan, Alan, the gray boy. He'd stuck a revolver in his mouth and fired. So that the back of his head had been blown away. It was because on the dance floor, Unable to stop myself, I suddenly said, I know. I know. You disgust me. And the searchlight that had been turned on the world was turned off again. I never... For one moment since, has there been any light that's stronger than this? Kitchen candle. She makes quite clear what killed him was her public insensitivity. She, in essence, exposed him. Through the story of Alan is this terrible horror and tragedy of public exposure and downfall. Gay drama at its best can't be realistic. Realism is always literally problematic. That is, there is a problem that has to be solved. And the problem when homosexuality comes into the picture is it's homosexuality that has to be solved. It's got to kill himself or shoot himself or walk off the stage or something. Alan's story does not end with his death. The theme of exposure and downfall is carried on by Blanche herself. Blanche comes into a world in which she does not belong. She comes into that world carrying a guilty sexual secret for which she is humiliated and ultimately exorcised from that world. Of course, the frightening thing for gay men at that time was the secret being found out. Blanche is, in essence, found out and then brutally treated for it. <laughs> I don't mind you being older than what I thought, but all the rest of it. God! That pitch about your ideals being so old-fashioned and all the malarkey you've dished out all summer. Oh, I knew you weren't 16 anymore, but I was fool enough to believe you were straight. And who says I wasn't straight? My loving brother-in-law and you believed him. I called him a liar at first, and then I checked on the story. First I asked our supply man who travels through Laurel. And then I'll talk directly over long distance to this merchant. Who is the merchant? Keyfarber. The merchant Keyfarber of Laurel. I know the man. He whistled at me. I put him in his place. So for revenge, he makes up stories about me. Three men, Keyfarber, Stanley, and Shaw, swore to them. Rub a dub dub. Three men in a tub and such a filthy tub. Didn't you stay at a hotel called the Flamingo? Flamingo? No. Tarantula was the name of it. I stayed in a hotel called the Tarantula Arms. Tarantula? Yes. A big spider. That's where I brought my victims. 
Yes, I had many intimacies with strangers. After the death of Alan, intimacies with strangers was all I seemed able to fill my empty heart with. You can look at Blanche as, in some ways, an extension of the whole sort of Victorian problem play heroine and the whole double standard that certain things are all right for men, but not all right for women. You can see a gay man as having an insight into that double standard. Some critics now began to confuse creator with creation. Those in the know knew that Williams was gay and that he occasionally used his female characters to speak on his own behalf. What escaped such critics was that these female characters were also speaking for themselves. That women, too, were excluded from the American dream was a theme explored further by William Inge, a gay man and one of the most successful playwrights of the 50s. His plays Come Back, Little Sheba and Picnic were stories of sexuality denied and sexuality liberated. That women and gay men might see American society the same way was something critics refused to acknowledge. Take the case of Edward Albers, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Once this tale of a feuding couple, complete with fantasy child, seemed in danger of winning a Pulitzer Prize. Albi was accused of misogyny. When Virginia Woolf was first on, there were a number of men who uh, were very angry at the portrayal of, of women uh, in, in that play. But it was very interesting to me. I talked to a great number of women about this, and none of them thought it was inaccurate. It was only the men who didn't like this, this portrayal of women, and women thought it was just dandy and quite accurate. I give all you bastards five to come out from where you are hiding. I cry all the time too, Daddy. I cry all the time. But deep inside so no one can see me. I cry all the time and Georgie cries all the time. We both cry all the time. And then what we do, we take our tears and we put them in the ice box in the goddamn ice trays until they're all frozen and then we put them in our drinks. In 1963, an article by the New York Times drama critic Howard Taubman launched a full-scale attack on gay playwrights. This included a helpful checklist of the telltale signs of a homosexual play. Be on guard for the male character whose proclivities are like a stallion's. Beware the husband who hasn't touched his wife for years. Look out for the baneful female who is a libel on womanhood. Be alert to scabrous innuendo about the normal male-female relationship. Three years later, the New York Times attacked again, now adding transvesticism to the charge sheet. The New York Times then drama critic suggested that a number of famous American playwrights, whom he did not mention, of course, the, the playwrights who dare not speak their name. <laughs> really, he was talking about me, William Inge and Tennessee Williams. The article suggested that we were really writing about male homosexual characters and disguising them as heterosexual female characters, thus uh, quite clearly doing severe damage to, uh, to, to the collective psyche of, of the United States. It was an extraordinarily cruel and, and in a way, stupid call because, um, first of all, the American playwright who wrote the greatest parts for women was Tennessee Williams. Writers who happen to be gay quite often write female characters with a great deal more sympathy than a lot of straight playwrights. 
a lot of females written by, written by straight men or, or um, a male version of what the female should be rather than an accurate version of what the female should be. Martha and Blanche Dubois are what women are really like. They just don't usually reveal it to straight men, or straight men don't want to see it. I think those were women out of female drag. They were women as gay men saw them in their actuality. If a straight playwright criticizes aspects of American society, right on target. If, if a homosexual playwright does, obviously there's something desperately wrong and, and, and twisted in, in, in the observation. The reason for those condemnations and for those attacks, in each case, comes from a political, comes from a political basis, which is the desire to keep the status quo and not to question things. The critics were right to be nervous. In the 1960s, all manner of social and sexual conventions would be exploded. With the new freedoms, gay playwriting came full circle. Joe Orton's techniques, wit, boldness, and deadpan style had never gone out of fashion. In What the Butler Saw, Orton earns his title of the Oscar Wilde of Welfare State Gentility. The whole issue of the play is a confusion of genders and how everybody gets confused. Part of the humor is, is, t is taking these heterosexuals and terrorizing them. Take your clothes off, Sonny. Lie on the couch. What are we to do now? I can't undress. You'd spot the deception at once. Keep calm. The situation, though desperate, is by no means lost. I shouldn't have behaved as I did, sir. I wasn't harmed. You enjoyed the experience? Would you enjoy normal intercourse? No, I might get pregnant. Or be the cause of pregnancy in others. He's just given away a vital piece of information. Do you think of yourself as a girl? No. Why not? I'm a boy. Do you have the evidence about you? I must be a boy. I like girls. Can't quite follow the reasoning there. Many men imagine that uh, preference for women is ipso facto a proof of virility. Someone should really write a book on these folk myths. Take your trousers down. I'll tell you which sex you belong to. I'd rather not know. You wish to remain in ignorance? Yes. I can't encourage you in such a self-indulgent attitude. You must face facts like the rest of us. You're... Forcing the boy to undergo a repetition of traumatic experience, uh, he might go insane. This is a mental home. He couldn't choose a more appropriate place. Undress. My time is valuable. I can't go on, Doctor. I must tell the truth. I'm not a boy. I'm a girl. Excellent. A confession at last. He wishes to believe he's a girl in order to minimise the feelings of guilt after homosexual intercourse. I pretended to be a boy. I did it to help Dr Prentice. How does it help a man if a girl pretends to be a boy? Wives get angry if they find their husbands have seduced and undressed a girl. But boys are fair game? I doubt whether your very personal view of society would go unchallenged. Undress me then, Doctor. Do whatever you like. Only prove that I'm a girl. If he's going to carry on like this, he'll have to be strapped down. Or wanted to create a panic. There's a kind of danger that's terrifying and elating at the same time. Like how far... He's not going to do that. He isn't going to... He did that. How did he get away with that? The whole point of, of comedy is to sort of get away with it. But to get away with something, you have to come close to something that's taboo and dangerous. Part of the exhilaration and why we pay our money and, and revere these people is that they do it for us. Orton died in 1967, a month after homosexuality was partially decriminalized and just a week before official state censorship by the Lord Chamberlain ended. To mark this dramatic occasion, members of the Lord Chamberlain's staff, having put down their blue pencils for the last time, have been to the theatre themselves. The Lord Chamberlain's men had had mixed success in their attempts to keep homosexuality off the stage. So had their American counterparts. Next week, we see what distorted images slip through the net. Thank you.
if you're gay. At least that's the way it was for over half this century. Homosexuality was illegal on both sides of the Atlantic and officially banned from the theatre. Yet despite censorship's best efforts, gay characters did occasionally sidle into the spotlight. I fought with myself, but it was stronger than I. When the censor wasn't looking, a small parade of pansies, perverts, psychopaths, and screaming queens flitted across the boards. <laughs> I hope I shan't meet you one day in Piccadilly with a painted face. I sentence you to three years. Progress was waiting in the wings. The growing pressure for law reform gradually began to loosen censorship's grip on the stage. During the 1950s and 60s, Gay playwrights like Tennessee Williams, Terence Rattigan and Joe Wharton would begin to pull back the curtain and demand centre stage. Overture and beginners, please. Nineteen twenty seven, New York. The town was buzzing with word of a shocking new play by an author called Jane Mast. The drag would be the first play this century to propel that taboo figure, the gay man, into the limelight. I'm one of those damned creatures who are called degenerates and moral lepers for a thing they cannot help, a thing that has made me suffer. Oh, God, Doctor, I can't explain. Tell me everything. This perversion of yours... Is it an acquired habit, or has it always been so? Always, from the earliest youth. I was born a male, but my mind had been that of a female. Why, as a child, I played with dolls. I even cried when they cut off my curls. As I grew older, the natural desires of a youth were unknown to me. I could not understand why women never interested me. I was attracted by my own sex. If these opening scenes were shocking enough... They were tame compared to what followed. No wonder author Jane Mast was better known as Mae West. And the drag was an excuse to present the ultimate in sensation. A frocky horror show, the Big Apple's resident fairies done up in their Saturday best. My, but you're getting thin. I am not. At least I can cling to a man without wearing him out. You're terribly fat. Fit! I should say not. I'm the type that men prefer. At least I can go through the Navy Yard without having the flags dropped to half mass. Listen, dearie, pull your aerial in. You're full of static. I'm just the type that men crave, the type that burns them up. Why, when I walk up 10th Avenue, you can just smell the meat sizzling in Hell's Kitchen. Ha! What she did to find the crucial actors for the play was to go to a Greenwich Village gay bar and kind of hold open auditions. Mae West was very clearly drawn to extremely flamboyant, 
types to drag queens, of whom there were an enormous number in the gay community in New York in the 20s. She was essentially asking people to play themselves. Why, the minute I walked into the jail, the captain says, Well, Kate, what kind of cell would you like to have? And I says, Oh, any kind will do, Captain, just so it's got a couple of peoples in it. I crave fresh air. There are gay characters in drag who sound gay. The words have changed, but the, the intonations haven't. The, the essential meanings, you may not know every, every single word, but you get it. This is new. This is the first time that modern gay characters appear on stage. Mae West was truly a pioneer. But the pioneer spirit was no longer worshipped in America. The Jazz Age audience may have been game for a thrill, but New York's moral guardians decided to save the public from the menace that was Mae West. The drag was dragged off before it could reach Broadway, and the self-styled empress of sex was charged with obscenity. The charges didn't stick, but the drag never opened. Never one to take things lying down, West then happily pushed her luck with The Pleasure Man, a backstage melodrama that reworked some of the same characters and gags from the drag. I hear you're working in a millinery shop. Yes, I to rim rough sailors. Oh, look, I can almost do the splits. Well, be careful, dearie, you'll wear out your welcome. I hear you're studying to be an opera singer. Oh, yes, and I know so many songs. Well, you must have a large repertoire. Must I have that, too? The Pleasure Man lasted longer than the drag. It ran for a grand total of one and a half performances. May was busted again. Still, she was right when she said, it's not what I do, it's the way that I do it. The jury was puzzled when witnesses couldn't deliver lines like, whoops, my dear, with sufficient snap. May was acquitted. But the New York authorities had had enough. After the pleasure man, the law allowed the closure of any theatre presenting an obscene play. Any depiction of homosexuality on stage, in any form, uh, whether it was comic, whether it was serious, whether it was incidental to the plot, um, any depiction of homosexuality overtly was illegal. America and Britain may have been divided by a common language, but they were united by shared prejudice. In London, too, overt homosexuality was banned by the Lord Chamberlain, who'd been busily censoring the public stage since 1737. But the comic potential of the effeminate man was just too hard to resist. The stage would find the effeminate man the easiest kind of gay character to pick up um, because of his comic value, because of his sensational value, and because you could present him in a sort of coded way. I mean, you could have a kind of effeminate shrieking man who your dialogue would kind of suggest was gay, but that didn't have to be anywhere explicitly signaled. As soon as you see enter a well-dressed, nervous, artistic, thin, sensitive young man, you know what is being said is enter a screaming queen. And that was fine. Uh, the Lord Chamberlain wouldn't object to that. You could take an effeminate man and he could be separate from the action and just camp about and be funny and make remarks. But they never paraded their relationship with anybody. <laughs> So I think it wasn't the sexual ambiguity. It was the act which really frightened people. In 1933 came the most daring play about homosexuality yet. Mordant Sharp's The Green Bay Tree, set amongst the moneyed Mayfair classes, could only be put on because of a get-out clause. Less worldly members of the audience could have taken the play 
as a warning against materialism. You do see a relationship between an older man and a younger man, and the atmosphere is of luxurious decadence. The sense is that of the young man being corrupted by wealth and opulence into homosexuality. The addictive cocktail for heterosexuals. The audience was left to decide whether Julian, the juvenile lead, played by Laurence Olivier on Broadway, was a closet case or simply not cut out for a nine-to-five life. Julian wasn't entirely sure himself, but his guardian, Mr. Dulcimer, was. You think you know me, but you're wrong. Very well, then. Go and get married. Disregard your temperament, your disposition, your everything that cries out against it. Beat out a living from the world and fashion a home for your wife and live in it and be happy ever after. Can you do it? Why do you torment me like this? Can you say Leonora comes before everything else? I don't care what I do and where I live so long as she is with me. Of course you can't. But you haven't the courage to admit it and it's only a fool who won't recognise his own limitations. However, I suppose that your silence means that you do recognise them, so we won't use any more harsh names. The relationship was there for all to see. It could not be mistaken. And that, I think, was what shocked everybody. Everybody thought that the poor old censor was so simple that he didn't realise what the play was about. It's quite possible that the censor thought, well, we will pass this because it shows homosexuality as being evil. Kiss me and say goodbye. Perhaps the lesson that homosexuality is not only corrupt, but corrupting, allowed the play's most surprising line, spoken by Julian's former fiancé to escape the censor's blue pencil. You haven't any feelings, not real feelings. If you cared anything for me, if you ever cared, you'd have chucked all this to the winds, really chucked it. Not just gone off a little way and hankered after it all the time. I was fool enough to believe that there was something more in you. Something that hadn't a chance to get out and that my love would set it free. I should have known last night when you didn't answer the phone that you'd succumb to all this again. And to him. I can't help it. He's the biggest thing in my life. Anyone can see that. I wonder how much you really care for him. I hope I shan't meet you one day in Piccadilly with a painted face just because you must have linen sheets. I hope I shan't see you in Piccadilly with a painted face because you must have linen sheets. And that really staggered the audience. The public had plenty of time to recover from the shock. The Lord Chamberlain wouldn't be so lenient again. It would be over 20 years before another such overt reference to homosexuality reverberated around the West End stage. A whole area of subject matter, of human life, was lost to the theatre. Rodney Ackland's 1952 The Pink Room is a case in point. The first version of the play, set in a wartime drinking club, has a married couple at the centre. It had to. Ackland's 1988 rewrite of The Pink Room, freed of censorship and retitled Absolute Hell, was essentially the same play. Now, however, it could come out of the closet. The leading character had in the pink room a rather boring character of a wife who came and told him off and told him that he wasn't leading the sort of life he should have led and that he was frittering his talents away. He was a novelist and she led him a lecture. 
Oh, Hugh, dear, is there nothing I can say or do to stop you throwing your life away in places like this? I, I'm not throwing my life away. Why must you always nag at me? What am I to do? Stand by while you ruin your life and say nothing. I can't take it any longer. In the rewritten version, this was turned into a male partner. It just was the bit of the puzzle that needed to be there. If you want to know the true view, the whole idea of queerness and everything connected with it, the whole ambience of boring camp and squalid promiscuity, nostalgia labu and hysterical emotionalism, I find unspeakably depressing. It just makes me sick. Well, I'm, I'm uh, sorry that I'm so unspeakably depressing to you. And that I'm so camp boring. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. No one else has ever told me I was. But I uh, bet I should make you sick. But everything about me just makes you sick. Now then, you pull yourself together. Reducing everything to the personal, you're going on exactly like a woman. Oh, I'm sorry, Nigel, I'm sorry, but I can't think why you should find that so objectionable. I should just about to marry one. Well, in this case, she happens to be a woman. In Britain, homosexuality would remain hidden. In America, homosexuals were to become ever more visible. But then targets have to be. Freedom-loving people all over the world stand alert to the menace of communism. 50s America feared the enemy within. And not just communists. Jimmy hadn't enjoyed himself so much in a long time. What Jimmy didn't know was that Ralph was sick. A sickness that was not visible like smallpox, but no less dangerous and contagious. A sickness of the mind. You see, Ralph was a homosexual, a person who demands an intimate relationship with members of their own sex. To most people, we were invisible. And those to whom we were visible, we were monsters. Quite simply, the most monstrous thing that you could think of or say or suspect anyone of was homosexuality. In 1948, a seismic shock rocked America. Dr. Alfred Kinsey informed the United States that over a third of the male population had had at least one homosexual experience. Who's taking you home tonight after the gas is through? The land of the free had to reassure itself that homosexuality was an affliction that could be cured with clean living, and if you were lucky enough, the love of a good woman. Enter heterosexual playwright Robert Anderson's Tea and Sympathy. The play is set in a boys' boarding school. It explores Kinsey's findings that homosexuality isn't just the preserve of the limp-wristed and screamingly obvious. The plot revolves around Tom, a sensitive boy the housemaster's wife has moved to befriend against the brutalities of a butch regime. A non is as butch as her own husband, the housemaster himself. The theme is actually less about being gay than about homophobia. And in fact, it's quite clearly placed on the fact that the headmaster of the house is into sports, the other boys are into sports. Um, and what he's being persecuted for, although it comes out as people claiming he's gay, is that he's not really man enough. The headmaster's wife goes to bed with the young man to show that, in fact, he's not gay. He's just sensitive.
years from now, when you talk about this, and you will, be kind. That line was high realism at the time. It's high camp now. Yet T and Sympathy made a radical statement in tune with Kinsey's report. The regular guy could be the regular gay. The house master ends up being a closeted homosexual. The paragon of masculinity is the homosexual, which says that homosexuals can't be a uh, stereotype. They aren't where you think they are, which, of course, in the McCarthy era makes them all the more frightening. Oh, my God, we can't spot them. In God's name, why? Because I love you. Why else? You've resented me. Almost from the day you married me, you've resented me. You never wanted to marry, really. Did they kid you into it? Does it would be headmaster have to be married? Or, or what was it, Bill? You'd be far happier going off on your jaunts with the boys, having them to your rooms for feeds and bull sessions. It's part of being a master. Other masters and their wives do not take two boys with them whenever they go on vacations or weekends. They are boys without privileges. And I became a wife without privileges. You became a wife. Yes. You did not become a wife. I know. I know I failed you in some terrible way. I failed you. You were more interested in mothering that fairy up there than in being my wife. But you wouldn't let me, Bill. You wouldn't let me. Whatever do you mean I wouldn't let you? Did it ever occur to you that you persecute in town? That boy up there. You persecute in him the thing you fear in yourself. Certainly, homosexuality is thought of as an awful thing, but at least it's saying it exists. So there's a beginning of talking about the subject, and once you talk about the subject as much as the subject was talked about in the 50s, then something is going to happen. In this new climate of queasy tolerance, homosexuality was forgiven as a sickness. That's what the medical and psychiatric communities insisted, though the law still prosecuted it as a crime. Nonetheless, a resistance movement was beginning. All of which was ignored on liberal, artistic, permissive Broadway. And so the leading dramatist of his generation, Tennessee Williams, still couldn't write openly about gay relationships. No one could. Which isn't to say that Williams' cat on a hot tin roof isn't about homosexuality. The gay characters may have died before the audience take their seats, but they provide the moral of the play. The worst thing you can do is to humiliate or cut off a gay man. Those characters are judged ethically on the basis of how they treat a homosexual. Cat on a hot tin roof is haunted by the figure the audience never meets. Skipper has killed himself and his best friend Brick is now drowning in drink and regret for what might have been. And what might have been is open to interpretation. There is no Cat in a Hot Tin Roof without Skipper. You don't see him on stage, but he is the crux of the play. What Skipper felt for Brick and what Brick is dealing with probably having felt for Skipper. You started drinking when your friend Skipper died. What are you suggesting? I'm suggesting nothing. The Cooper of May suggested that there was something not right exactly. exactly not right? Not, well, exactly normal in your friendship. They suggested that too. I thought that was Maggie's suggestion. 
Who else's suggestion is it? Is it yours? How many others thought that skip on? Now, hold on. Hold on a minute, son. I knocked around in my time. What's that got to do? Hold on. I bummed. I bummed this country. Whose suggestion? Whose suggestion is it? hobo jungles and railroad wires and flop houses and all the stuff. Oh, you think so, too? You call me your son and a queer. Oh, maybe that's why you put Maggie and me in this room that was Jack Straws and Peter Ocello's, in which that pair of old sisters slept in a double bed where both of them died. In Cat, you don't only have one dead homosexual. You have three. Because the play, the, the main item in the set in Cat Notch Nerf is this enormous bed which Williams talks about is supposed to be just gigantic, the bed of Jack Straw and Peter Ocello, this gay couple. They are the only happy marriage in that play. When Jack Straw died, my old Peter Ocello quit eating like a dog does when its master's dad died too. Just saying, I understand such... Skip is dead! I have not quit eating! No, but you started drinking! You think so, too! Shh! Go away! Just broke a glass! You think so, too? You think so, too? You think Skip and me did? Dear, dear, shot of me together! Hold is that... on a minute! You think we did dirty things between us? Why are you uh, shouting like that? that? Why are you so excited? I don't think nothing. I don't know nothing. I'm simply telling you why. Me and Skipper were a pair of dirty old men. Now, Strong Ocello, a couple of ducking sissies, queers. Is that what you think? It's a scene about the son's homosexuality in which the father is understanding and the son is homophobic. And it's this strange reversal. There's a lot of Williams' father in Big Daddy. He's kind of presenting the wish fulfillment of the way he wished his father had been. In 1957, two years after Cat on a Hot Tin Roof opened, Williams' father died. He immediately went into psychoanalysis hoping that he could be cured of his homosexuality. But he couldn't. Nor could William Inge, Tennessee Williams' former protégé and ex-lover, the reigning poet of repression and lust in 50s America. Bring me a dream Make him the cutest that I've ever seen Give him two lips like roses and clover And tell him that his lonesome nights are over Send it. In plays like Comeback Little Sheba, Bus Stop and Picnic Inge dramatised the daily torments of dull backwater life and why lonely women fell for horny studs. For American theatre at the time, Inge is actually very important that he actually manages to bring a very closeted gay sensibility, which focuses to a large degree about sexuality and the importance of sexuality in people's lives in a way that I think many people could hear much better than they could actually hear Tennessee Williams, who was, for many tastes, overly poetic. Hung up, unhappy, alcoholic, Inge attempted to purge himself with a short play written at the end of the 1950s. It was never to be performed. It was entitled The Tiny Closet. The Tiny Closet is a play he claimed to have written under psychoanalysis about what it means to be a repressed homosexual in, one would assume, Kansas in um, the 50s.
The leading character is a sensitive man. Codes, of course. He lives in this rooming house with these very nasty women. He has this closet in the rooming house. The women, of course, are sure there's something awful in there. So finally, they force open the closet door, and what's in there is women's clothes. The imagery is very interesting. Closets, women's clothing. It's so hopeless. I mean, there's no space for anything kind of healthy. Inge could never see his way out of this world. Inge could never see that he actually might have the young track star. Inge's life and his plays to some degree function almost as a sort of a cautionary tale of a kind of gay sensibility that actually doesn't really get you anything in the long run. In 1973, William Inge took his own life. theatre in the 1950s was dominated by middle-class mores and the tyranny of good taste, presided over by impresarios like Hugh Binky Bowman, czar of the London stage. The theatre had to answer to the ruling classes. The Lord Chamberlain policed the stage by royal appointment as if one queen was determined to see off all others. Lord Chamberlain had a group of readers who were mostly um, retired naval officers with incredibly filthy minds who would see filth often where none was intended. By the time I came into the theatre in the 50s, the real fury of the office was devoted to anything homosexual. I did the first um, English production of Tennessee Williams' Cat and Hot Tin Roof in 1958, and that was banned because of the suggestion that Brick, the uh, young male lead, might possibly have been homosexual. Might possibly have been. That there wasn't there. Anyway, uh, the only way you could get the play on was to turn the theatre into a club, and the comedy theatre was turned into a club. Two weeks after you'd filled in a form and paid your money, you could buy a theatre ticket and be corrupted and presumably also be burnt to death because the um, fire regulations didn't obtain either. Also in the club were Tea and Sympathy and, more surprisingly, Arthur Miller's A View from the Bridge. A View from the Bridge was banned because at one point one man kisses another on the mouth. That was enough for the censor. The censor didn't allow homosexuality, period. Neither did the law. While the Lord Chamberlain cut, edited and banished gay men out of existence, prisons filled up with the prosecuted. Neither art nor life had a fitting role for the gay man. Then in 1953, the arrest of one of British theatre's leading men, Sir John Gielgud, inadvertently pushed homosexuality centre stage. His friend, Terence Rattigan, was profoundly affected by Gielgud's ordeal. He went on stage that night, and many people, including Rattigan, who actually went to the theatre to see what happened, they were all 
terrified that the audience would boo. But exactly the reverse happened. The audience cheered. His courage at going on. Rattigan was astonishingly proud of them for doing the right thing. Gielgud's experience is echoed by that of the disgraced major in Rattigan's play, Separate Tables. But, yet again, homosexuality is conspicuous by its absence. The local newspaper reports that the major is arrested for molesting women in a cinema. Mrs. Osborne, giving evidence, stated that Pollock, sitting next to her, persistently nudged her in the arm and later attempted to take other liberties. She subsequently vacated her seat and complained to an usherette. Rattigan hoped and believed audiences would understand that he was really talking about homosexuality. In a letter, he wrote, I was in fact saying to them, look, ladies and gentlemen, the Lord Chamberlain has forced me into an evasion. You and I will foil him. In effect, Terry was actually suggesting that the audience got it at once. I'm not sure. In fact, I'm absolutely certain in my own mind that's not the case. I believe that the audience took the major as heterosexual. Two years later, Rattigan tried again. Separate tables transferred to Broadway, with the playwright determined to make the major, as nature intended him, homosexual. Rattigan rewrote the major. So it was abundantly clear that the major had been, in fact, arrested for importuning men by constantly asking for a light on the esplanade at one o'clock in the morning. Inspector Franklin, giving evidence, said that a watch was kept on Pollock for roughly an hour. During this time, he was seen to approach no less than four persons, on each occasion with an unlighted cigarette in his mouth. A petrol lighter, in perfect working order, was found in his pocket. His American producer was aghast. You absolutely must not do it. Had Rattigan taken that critical decision and revealed that he was actually asking for sympathy for his homosexual character, I think he would have been placed at the front of the next generation. But his desire to protect his position in society, his success, and his own discomfort at potentially revealing his own sexual inclination stopped him. In 1957, the Wolfenden Report recommended that homosexual sex be partly decriminalised. The Lord Chamberlain decided to allow homosexuality to be written into the plot, just as long as there were no practical demonstrations of love between men. In other words, no gay sex, no gay relationships. In his next play, Variation on a Theme, Rattigan included a gay character. Though the core love affair was still straight enough for mass consumption. Oh, well, that's what Rattigan hoped. So, you love me. So why are you always needling me? Sending me up? Taking the mickey out of me. Why? Why? Why do you needle me? It's not you I needle, Ron. It's myself. Oh, that's another thing. You're talking a lot of bloody riddles to me all the time. As if you're just talking to yourself, trying to make yourself laugh. Have you got no feelings at all? Have you ever given one minute's thought to me in the last two months? Yes, Ron. Quite a few minutes. I wonder. Have you ever given any thought to what it must have been like for me? I'll stay over here for a couple of evenings a week whenever there's no important people around because 
common Ron mustn't meet important people. Oh dear, no, that'd never do. The speech of the young man is a speech that had been given to Terry by a variety of young men, but certainly by two significant young men, Kenneth Morgan and Michael Franklin, who said time after time, well, we, we don't want to be pushed in the corner when smart people come to, to dinner or carrying the drinks tray when they come to the country house. Rattigan's variation on a theme was seized on by uh, the newspaper theatre critics uh, uh, as an obvious example of a hidden homosexual relationship. The richish, older homosexual being attracted to younger men and sometimes working class men. I hardly ever see you. Whenever you call me in the mornings, we don't say much to each other, just gossip. Your friends treat me like dirt, and so do you, only more polite, and yet I can't damn well do without you. I need you in my life. For some bloody silly reason which I can't explain. I need you in my life. Rattigan was out of step, out of time. Another generation of playwrights was taking advantage of the new climate. But the images of gay men they produced were old, still troubled, still lonely, were the only of pity. One of the difficulties that the relaxing of the Love Chamberlain's rules created was that you were allowed to represent a certain sort of gay man. By and large, you were representing a gay man who was a problem for himself and for other people. We were deeply unfortunate, we were pathological, we couldn't help ourselves, but that it was wrong to put us in prison. In 1965, the Royal Court Theatre and John Osborne challenged the Lord Chamberlain with A Patriot For Me, a costume drama with themes of empire, betrayal and female impersonation. Not only was the lead character gay, there was a full-scale drag ball. The manuscript's arrival caused consternation in the Lord Chamberlain's office. And an important official wrote that the scene of the drag ball was particularly dangerous because it showed homosexuals at their most attractive. And therefore, there was the likelihood that there would be large congregations of homosexuals being a nuisance and being attracted by these men dressed up as women. The Lord Chamberlain banned the play. But in time honoured tradition, the court turned itself into a private club and asked the public to judge for themselves. You're so worthless. You can't even recognise the shred of petty virtues in others, some of which I still have. Which is why you have nothing but contempt for anyone like me who admires you or loves you or wants and misses you and has to beg for you at least one day a fortnight. Yesterday, yesterday, I spent two excruciating hours at the most boring party at Moles I've ever been to, talking to endless people, couldn't see or hear, just hoping you would... God knows where you were. That you possibly, if I was lucky, might turn up. Just hoping you might look in so I could light your cigarette and watch you talking and even touch your hand briefly out of sight. You love me. Oh, in your way, yes. Like a squalling, ravenous, raging child. You want my style, my box at the opera instead of standing with the other officers. You're incapable of initiating anything yourself. If the world depended on the victors, on people like you, there'd be no first moves made, no inexpedient overtures, no stirring, no invention, no stirring whatsoever in you that doesn't come from elsewhere. Dear mother of God, you're like a woman. <laughs>
the tortured gay lead ultimately commits suicide, putting himself and the audience out of his misery. Thankfully, misery was fast going out of fashion. In the 60s, with law reform looming, even homosexuality could begin to let it all hang out. No one hung out better than Joe Orton. Orton's joke was to casually present homosexuality as though it was the most normal thing in the world. Orton's whole game is to laugh the assumption that there's something exceptional about or 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 sort of this was a sort of evil solitary pursuit it's just to laugh it away you know there's a wonderful passage in his diaries he starts in some urinal and pick up a guy and there ends up being ten guys and orgies going on in this and he describes it hilariously he thinks to himself, no more than 10 feet away from other people and about their ordinary business. He understands the thin line between primal sort of lust on the one hand and convention and containment. What's entertaining about Orton's entertaining Mr. Sloan is the casual coolness of a bisexual hustler who enjoys two genders with equal pleasure and equal cynicism. I help out on Saturdays with a mate of mine, Len. You might know him. Lifeguard at the bus one time. Nice chap. You fond of swimming? I like a plunge now and then. Bodybuilding? We had a nice little gym at the orphanage. Put me in all the teams they did. Relays. Soccer. Pole vault. Long distance, 100 yards, discus, putting the shot. Yes. Yes, I'm a all-rounder, a great all-rounder, in anything you care to mention, even in life. Yes, I like a good workout now and then. Hmm. Orton stated that he wanted Ed played as if he was the most ordinary man in the world, and not as if at the moment you wanted sex with boys, you had to put on earrings and scent. Orton is an interesting example of a, a queer man who w was disturbed by the whole notion of effeminacy. Orton's men are like Orton. They are not effeminate. They don't conform to the old notion of the stage homosexual. They subvert and threaten the status quo, so they become perhaps more dangerous. Well, well, well. Bodybuilder, are you? I bet you are. Do you exercise regular? It's clockwork. Good. Good. Stripped? Fully. Complete. How invigorating. And I box. I'm a bit of a boxer. <laughs> Ever done any wrestling? On occasions. So, so. I've got a full chest, narrow hips, and my biceps are... You wear leather next to the skin. Leather... Jeans, say, without uh... pants. <laughs> the way. Question is, are you clean living? You may as well know I set great store by morals. Too much of this casual bunking up nowadays. Too many lads being ruined by birds. Part of the pleasure of the sort of gay style is the boundary, is the world that they are rebelling against. The excitement, the exhilaration is crossing that boundary. 
And once you can say what you want, you don't have to be as cunning. Whereas you really have to be ingenious when you're trying to sort of say the unacceptable. You're really sort of skating uh, close to the wind, you know. In 1967, homosexuality in Britain was partially decriminalized. A year later, stage censorship ended and playwrights were free to say what they liked. A new era in theater was begun by the boys in the band. For the first time on stage, since Mae West probably, gay men dancing, gay men joking with one another, gay humor. There was a sense that for too long we've been suicidal, can witty but depressed and that we wanted a wider range of models next week we open the showroom to see the new models on offer revelation was at hand night, it's America's crown jewel. The Great White Way is a blaze of lights. The curtain is going up on two dozen shows. Broadway. Every sort of excitement, every sort of show, except one. Plays about homosexuality. And yet, many of the most celebrated plays of this century were written by gay men. who drew on their own lives for drama, but were forced to disguise the source of their inspiration. On both sides of the Atlantic, homosexuality haunted the dressing room and walked the wings until the end of the 1960s. Only then did gay men and gay love finally step center stage and take a bow. The myth that there was no money in putting on a show about homosexuality bit the dust in April 1968, when the boys in the band strutted and minced their hour upon the stage. The revelation, at least for the straight audience, was that the boys weren't isolated figures in a heterosexual landscape, but part of a gay social network. There had been plenty of gay characters in other plays, but it was, it was, they were always used as some sort of sensational gimmick, you know. Somebody blew their brains out, usually cut their wrist, jumped out the window, or something. The only thing the boys in the band did was just uh, take the characters as a given. I mean, they, they, they were homosexual from the moment the curtain went up, everybody knew it, and they got on with the play. Don't you just love that word, crumb? Oh, I love it. It's a real Barbara Stanwyck word. 
Call me a cab, you crump. Well, I see all vestiges of sanity for this evening are shot to hell. Oh, Donald, you're so serious tonight. You're fun stir, baby, and I'm eating for two. Forget your troubles, come on, get happy. You better chase all your blues away. Shot hallelujah. Oh, God, what's more boring than a queen doing a Judy Garland imitation? A queen doing a Betty Davis imitation. For the first time on stage, since Mae West probably, gay men dancing, gay men joking with one another, gay humor, movie references. We see a pretty accurate portrayal of a certain level of gay life. But there was a less attractive side to gay life in the play. After a round of truth games, the mood turns ugly, exposing the self-loathing of the central character, Michael. Michael, will you stop the goddamn crying and take this pill? I'm like old man River, tired of living and scared of dying. Michael. If we could just not hate ourselves so much. You know, that's it. If we could just learn not to hate ourselves quite so very much. Yes, I know. I know. Inconceivable as it may be, you used to be worse than you are now. Maybe with a lot more work, you can help yourself some more. If you try. Who was it who always used to say, you show me a happy homosexual and I'll show you a gay corpse. <sighs> For some, the boys in the band signaled progress. For others, it merely confirmed their prejudice. A lot of people saw only the poison and were able to say, well, that... Uh, the life of a gay man is poisonous. And, but you have to take those chances. If you're going to tell the truth, you're going to have uh, your enemies, as it were, are going, to, are going to take that truth and distort it and, and use it against you. You can't, you, you, you can't speak the truth and not have it thrown back in your face by somebody. The moral of the play comes in Harold, the sort of birthday boy, and the meanest queen on stage, although also the one who tells the most truth, says to the host of the party, Michael, um, the trouble with you is that you're a homosexual and you don't want to be one. And at and, and that moment, the play, what's ever been in the play already about gay men not liking themselves is put into total perspective. In fact, it, it's quite a totally life-affirming play. Now it is my turn. And ready or not, Michael, here goes... You are a sad and pathetic man. You're a homosexual and you don't want to be. But there is nothing you can do to change it. Not all your prayers to your God, not all the analysis you can buy in all the years you've got left to live. You may very well one day be able to know a heterosexual life if you want it desperately enough, if you pursue it with the fervor with which you annihilate but you will always be homosexual as well. Always, Michael. Always. Until the day you die. The real drama was happening off stage. In July 1969, a routine police raid on the Stonewall Inn in New York sparked three nights of rioting that gave birth to gay liberation. While the boys in the band were still on Broadway, gay men and women in their thousands decided to kick open the closet door. Good news travels fast. Britain, too, lit the pink touch paper. 
the new message of pride was to be taken to the people. French theatre company Gay Sweatshop toured all over Britain with work not ashamed to be labelled propaganda. For too long we'd been suicidal, we'd been camp, we'd been um, witty but depressed. We wanted a wider range of models. You were not only going to see plays that depicted homosexuals, but that a majority of those people on that stage and the people who created the work were the thing itself, and that had never been seen before. The plays were gay agitprop, if you like. They went around the country encouraging people as a political act to come out. At the end of Mr X, one of Gay Sweatshop's earliest plays, the actor Alan Pope addressed the audience and identified himself as a gay man. Gay Sweatshop also mined the rich seam of drama hidden in the past. The company was very keen to do something that looked at gay men in history and to, by that, not the list of famous names or groups of ordinary gay men in history. As Time Goes By was the first play to mention and mourn gay men's fate in the Holocaust. It inspired Martin Sherman to write his own play on the subject, Bent. As time goes by, I had a huge effect on my, my future as a playwright because I saw a dress rehearsal of it and there was a sentence in it about um, pink triangles in, in Nazi Germany, which immediately set a light bulb off in, in my head, so it, it directly influenced me. Uh, to write Ben. Bent brought the Nazi persecution of gay men to the attention of a mainstream audience. But Sherman's aim was also to use the past to warn the present. I had been stewing for some time about gay society then, in the 70s, which seemed to me to have become very semi-open, very commercialised, and very brutalised. And had very little to do on the surface with love and compassion. It crystallised for me one day in, in the village in New York when I saw two men walking down the street in full Nazi uniform and which was meant to be a huge sexual turnover, and I thought they have no idea of what this represents. There was no sense of politics on the street. There was only sex. And so it seemed to me that it wasn't free at all, and that until you change laws, and until you make a society that is welcoming to everybody. You, any, any sense of freedom other than that is, is, is an illusion. In Bent, Max pretends to be Jewish, so he may wear the yellow star, rather than the even more degrading pink triangle, the Nazi symbol for known homosexuals. Even in the hell of a concentration camp, Max must deny who he is. And in a harrowing speech, he admits what he did to get his yellow star. They took me into that room. Where? Into that room. On the train? On the train, and they said, prove that you're... And I did. Prove that you're what? Not. Not what? Queer. How? Her. Her. And they said, if you... And I did. Did what? Her made... Made what? Love. Who to? Her. Who was she? Only... Maybe... Maybe only... Thirteen. She was... Maybe... She was dead. 
just just dead minutes a bullet in her and they said prove that you're and I did prove that you're lots of them watching drinking he's a bit bent they said he can't but I did how I don't know I don't know I wanted to stay alive In one of Bent's most memorable scenes, Horst and Max talk each other to orgasm under the dumb gaze of the guards. When Horst is later shot, Max picks up his lover's coat and wears the dead man's pink triangle. It's his last and first defiant act before rushing the perimeter fence. The place said you have to stand up and be who you are, honestly. You have to be open about your sexuality. And a lot of people who came to see it were people who were not open about their sexuality and couldn't be. They came from, they came from generations that just wouldn't have it. It was a certain excitement in those past generations of living a secret life and even having what, what it was they really did, a, a secret from the general public. Having it on a stage blew the goods. The new generation who'd come out since Stonewall had had enough of living in secret. But is sexual freedom the same thing as equality? That was the question troubling the international stud, the first part of Harvey Firestein's Torch Song trilogy. Set in the busy back room of a gay bar, the play is both satire and documentary. Mary. Someone's got his hand on my high knee. Can you see what he looks like? But yes, it does make a difference. Oh, Murray. Murray. He's reaching round front and opening my belt. Murray. Murray, he's opening my zipper. Murray. Murray, wh what do I do? With a beer can. Help. Marie! International Stud changed my idea of what was possible on stage and, and about talking about gay sex or sex. I've never seen anything like that. When in the back room scene where Harvey is getting screwed from the rear as he's having this conversation with somebody else, after that scene, what is not permissible is the question. Uh, do you come here often? Nope. I don't have to talk. <laughs> no, that's perfectly all right. I mean, it's not my fantasy or anything. The conversation, that is. <laughs> Though I must admit, I am prone to sweet nothings deftly whispered. However, they are not essential to my enjoyment of the lovemaking experience. <laughs> I much prefer to open my senses completely to the moment, thereby retaining more of an impression whereon to draw on later dates. <laughs> Ah, if you get my drift. <laughs> you? Hello? Where'd he go? By the third part of Torch Song Trilogy, Arnold presides over a pretend family. Him, his lover, and an adopted gay son. Torch Song Trilogy ends up four square for a gay man's right to have the same life his parents had. That is, a happy marriage, kids, he has a husband and child at the end of the play. It is one of the most articulate statements of the pro-marriage side of gay life. 
There is a massive agenda of what is the good homosexual relationship. Um, is it um, leather queen bad, drag queen bad, stable couple good, or is it actual stable couple bad because they're raping heterosexual marriage, um, promiscuous, Whitman-esque, brotherly love, uh, going out in the evening and picking someone up, that means, um, is that good? That You see that agenda laid out often very nakedly in a lot of recent uh, gay playwriting. Kevin Elliott's 1982 comedy, Coming Clean, gets to grips with the practicalities of gay relationships. Should they be open or closed? And how are such accommodations to be reached? It's about a couple of men who try and <clears throat> forge an open relationship, um, which means that um, they uh, have more than one partner, etc. And they... Uh, Find one finds it much more difficult than the other, and the whole thing ends rather disastrously. When one partner is caught having an affair at home, despite the agreement that sexual adventures should stay outside, the couple are forced to re-examine the rules they live by, and find they don't quite match. Oh, shit, you're not making this any easier for me. Why should I be responsible for making things easier? You should be down on your fucking knees, not standing there giving me a lecture on how to conduct relationships. Tony. Your teaching credits aren't exactly shit hot at the moment. Why should I listen to someone who thinks with his cock? Tony. You really are an arrogant bastard. Make things easier for you, Jesus Christ. The only thing I've ever wanted is to be with you. I can do without anything as long as I've got you. I can't bear the thought of you looking at anyone else. Let alone making love to them. Whenever I knew you were with a trick, I felt sick. I tried not to think about it, but I couldn't get it out of my mind. That you'd whisper the same things you whisper to me. Moan in the same way when you came. Kiss. Let you kiss me after it's all over. And hold him in your arms and close your eyes. I can't cope with it anymore. I'm tired of all the bars and clubs. I'm tired of competing, pretending I need other men when all I want is you. I don't think that it's a bad um, thing to try and forge new forms of relationships. I've, um, it's just that I think all relationships are terribly hard. Um, I mean, it's hard enough finding someone to have a relationship with in the first place. Um, and then you have to work out how to get on with them. And so I think you have to make your own... I mean, if you, if you, if you discard rules like the rules of the marriage contract or, or whatever, uh, then you have to create new rules. You have to have rules. In the 1980s, the rules were rewritten. AIDS would leave chaos, devastation, and panic in its wake. Gay lives, gay relationships, and gay theatre were to change irrevocably. AIDS was first reported in the United States in July 1981. William Hoffman's As Is was the first mainstream play to discuss its effects. The New York Times printed an article about how uh, gay men were dying of some syndrome. Something was killing us. And I read it in the paper and I burst out laughing because I couldn't figure out how a disease could figure out who was gay. There was something that changed in me immediately. When I read that, the Black Plague came into my mind. So I wrote a scene about how um, Christopher Street was going to change under the influence of a plague.
Kyrie has Carposi sarcoma. Matt has difficulty breathing. He went for tests today. I haven't slept all in weeks. Every morning I examine my body for swellings, marks. I'm terrified of every pimple, every rash, even though I've tested negative. If I cough, I think of Teddy. I wish he would die. He is dead. He may as well be. Why can't he die? I feel the disease closing in on me. As is, would set out the themes of gay drama for a decade to come. Marking the change from coming out to staying alive. Playwrights were trying to unmoor AIDS from a kind of moral causality. You did a naughty thing, therefore you're going to die. There's this lament for it, for what did exist once and what AIDS has killed, which is this paradise. What a lot of people of that generation saw as a kind of sexual paradise. I used to love sleaze. Oh. You know, the whining self-pity of a rainy Monday night in a leather bar in early spring. <laughs> Five o'clock in the morning in the mine shaft with the bathtubs full of guys dying to get pissed on and whipped. A subway john full of horny high school students. <laughs> in Morocco, getting raped over a tombstone in Marrakesh. God, how I miss it! I really miss my filthy old ripped out patched button fly jeans that I sun bleached on myself our first weekend in the island. You remember? It was Labor Day. Memorial Day. And we did blot our acid. Do you remember acid before they put the speed in it? And we drank muscadet whenever we got thirsty, which we did a lot. Remember? Remember Sunday afternoons getting blitzed on beer? Oh, and suddenly it was Sunday night. You're getting fucked in the second floor window of the Hotel Christopher, being cheered on <laughs> by a mob of hundreds of men. And suddenly it's Friday a week later and he's moved in sleeping next to you and you want him to go because you've met his brother, Rod or Lance. Miles. Late of the merchant marines who's even humpier. Orgies at the baths. People are startled by the frankness at which I talk about how much fun I, of that those those times could be. Is that I, I didn't feel called upon to condemn it from a present point of view. That uh, if, if they're inappropriate now, why condemn what was what was once fun? It was great. <laughs> Not everyone agreed. Even before AIDS, some voices in the gay community had been arguing that unbridled sex was dehumanizing. It was not a popular view. Its best known advocate was already a controversial figure, playwright Larry Kramer. There are ways of coming to terms with your sexuality without sharing it with the entire world. And, um, and I guess I sound like a prude even now when I say all of this. Uh, straight people don't do it, uh, most of them. And, and uh, I, I, I just am not going to, of all the fights that we have to fight in this world, the right to fight for, for unlimited public sex seems to me very low down on the list. AIDS transformed Kramer into an activist. When it became clear that little progress was being made on AIDS research, Kramer turned his anger on the authorities. He thought were content to let gay men suffer and die. The city is spending precious little. We are being picked off one by one by one. I think it is conscious genocide. Larry being a very political person, and someone who just doesn't sit around and whine like the rest of us, uh, found an outlet for it and, 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 uh, and organized a gay men's health crisis and, and, and organized ACT UP when gay men's health crisis wasn't doing enough. And, and he really did go to the mayor's office and really did go to the, the doctors and, and the scientists. Set in the early days of the AIDS crisis, 
Crame as the Normal Heart was an autobiographical account of a time of confusion, hostility, and high feeling about a disease that simultaneously united and divided gay men. The character of the passionate and partisan Ned Weeks is a portrait of Kramer himself. Everything actually happened as an event. In my mind, anyway. They may have been compressed or telescoped or whatever the expression is, but, but all the events happened. All the characters in it were, were and are real. This is what Ned wrote for me to send out. If this doesn't scare the shit out of you and drive you to action, gay men may have no future here on Earth. Neddy, I think it's a bit much. You'll scare everybody to death. Shake up. What's wrong with that? This isn't something that can be force-fed gently. It won't work. Mickey neglected to read my first sentence. It's difficult to write this without sounding alarmist or scared. Okay, but then listen to this. I am sick of guys moaning that giving up careless sex until this blows over is worse than death. I'm sick of guys who can only think of their cocks. I'm sick of closeted gays. It's 1982 now, guys. When are you going to come out? By 1984, you could be dead. You're crazy. Am I? There are almost 500 cases now. Okay, if we're not sending it out, I'll get the native to run it. But we can't tell people how to live their lives. We just can't do that. And besides, the entire gay political platform is fucking. We'll get it from all sides. You make it sound like that's all that being gay means. <laughs> that's all it does mean. It's the only thing that makes us different. I don't want to be considered different. Well, neither do I, actually. Well, I do. Well, you are. Unfortunately, that's all it seems to have come to me. When we started, it meant a lot more. Why is it we can only talk about our sexuality, and so relentlessly? You know, Mickey, all we've created is generations of guys who can't deal with each other as anything but erections. It was the first time that theater really began to matter because that was the only place you could get any information about AIDS. It was not appearing in the newspapers. God knows it certainly wasn't on television or in the movies. People had to see that play. It was not just, you know, a hot ticket. Suddenly there was real debate real agonizing over what it meant to be gay and what the responsibilities were of being gay. It made gay writing uh, extraordinarily penetrating and extraordinarily important in, in so many ways. These voices had to be heard where, no, enough already with hiding, with the closet, with being careful. Suddenly when everyone you know is dying, what your Aunt Sylvia thinks of your private life becomes obscenely unimportant. It's why writing during a real war often creates wonderful works. But the stakes are so high. did a strange thing to gay men because it in a way made gay men respectable subjects for mainstream drama, film, television, partly because you could always kill them off at the end. That is, you could focus on them and feel sorry for them and then not have to deal with them again. It's okay to have gays on stage as long as they're going to die, and die quite horribly of a disease, of course, that is their own fault. I think that's part of the reason for the acceptance uh, of a lot of uh, recent gay plays, r rather than, than their excellence as literature or, or usefulness uh, in our society. That's there, too. But I think there's something, there's an undercurrent there that I find quite ugly. If we were not dying, 
if we were in fact alive and loving, I don't think we'd run very long on Broadway. I think it would be over in two nights and back with bad reviews. AIDS taught us that we were not tolerated all that much, that our deaths by the hundreds and then by the thousands were really a matter of complete indifference or worse, um, convenience or even a cause for celebration on the part of the heterosexual majority. AIDS taught us being tolerated is not a substitute for having power. Tony Kushner's Angels in America is an epic in which AIDS is only one thread in a wider pattern made up of love, friendship, power, and the abuse of power. In the play, gay men are numbered among the architects of oppression, as well as the victims. One of its central characters is the real-life red baiter and closeted homosexual, Roy Cohn, a former henchman of Senator Joseph McCarthy. Cohn was a genuine monster who didn't hesitate to blackmail other gay men. When I started writing Angels in America in 1986, where Cohn had just died of AIDS, I was appalled by the way his death was treated by the old left. Um, I thought that it was, uh, it revealed a great deal of the, the homophobia of the old left, and I found myself in a very uncomfortable position of feeling angry on Roy Cohn's behalf. Um, and because he was such an incredibly awful human being, that was a very strange place to be. That made me ask a lot of questions of myself about what a uh, community means and what uh, a community based on sexual identity means and how wide its embrace is and what the um, meaning of its embrace is since it includes people um, like Roy Cohn. The fact that there were a number of deeply closeted gay men in the radical right is fascinating to me. And I really wanted to try and understand how someone could be both politically reactionary and a gay man, and in Roy's case, actually a homophobe. Homosexuals are men who in 15 years of trying cannot get a piss and anti-discrimination bill through city council. Homosexuals are men who know nobody and who nobody knows, who have zero clout. Does this sound like me, Henry? No. No. I have clout. A lot. I can pick up this phone, punch 15 numbers, and you know who will be on the other end in under five minutes, Henry. The president. Even better, Henry. His wife. A power mongerer like Roy had a complete lack of identity with uh, people who were willing to sacrifice their clout in the name of a politics that someone like Roy thought was purely insane. Roy Cohn is not a homosexual. Roy Cohn is a heterosexual man, Henry, who fucks around with guys. Okay, Roy. And what is my diagnosis, Henry? You have AIDS, Roy. No, Henry, no. AIDS is what homosexuals have. I have liver cancer. Angels in America's cast of characters, the powerful and the excluded, the black and the white, the gay and the straight, interconnect in a hyper-theatrical world of imagination that freely mixes fantasy and reality. Angels in America isn't quite like any other play formally. It's sort of like uh, movies in some ways, and it's cross-cutting. It's sort of like Shakespeare in some ways. It sort of invents this dual scene business in very interesting ways. The best gay plays invent their own dramatic form.
Well, this is the most depressing hallucination I have ever had. Apologies, I do try to be amusing. Oh, don't apologize. You, I can't expect someone who's really sick to entertain me. How on earth did you know? Oh, it happens. This is the very threshold of revelation sometimes. I can see things, how sick you are. Do you see anything about me? Yes. What? You are amazingly unhappy. Oh, big deal. You meet a valium addict and you figure out she's unhappy. That doesn't count, of course. I'm something else, something surprising. Something surprising? Yeah. Your husband's a homo. Oh, ridiculous. Really? Threshold of revelation. Well, I don't like your revelations. I don't think you intuit very well at all. Joe's a very normal man. He... Oh, God. Oh, God. Do homos take, like, lots of long walks? Yes, we do. In stretch pants with lavender coifs, up and down the avenues of Sodom and Gomorrah, tripping along lightly in our loafers. It's just that I looked at you and there was... A sort of blue streak of recognition. Yes. Like you knew me incredibly well. Yes. Yes. I have to go now. Get back. Something just fell apart. Oh, God. I feel so sad. In the 1990s, AIDS was a fact of life and death that couldn't be ignored. Nor could gay theatre allow it to dominate. Kevin Elliott's solution was My Night with Reg, an Olivier award-winning comedy with all gay characters. I don't write about AIDS as an issue at all in it. Um, in fact, I never mention the word quite deliberately. And I use it as an expression of mortality. The play is about this group of people who keep making plans, keep wanting something to happen, anticipate something happening, and then the next scene happens, and arbitrarily, one of them's been picked off. Reg never appears on stage, but his energetic sex life sets in motion a series of revelations, evasions, and bitter truths, even from the grave. I can't help feeling that Reg was having his cake and eating it. What does it matter? Quite a few cakes, by all accounts. What? Well, he wasn't exactly a saint, was he? What do you mean? I I'm not telling you anything new. Well, what are you telling me? Nothing. Guy? I suppose all I'm saying is that if he could do that to Daniel, why couldn't he do it to you? He was having an affair. No. No. I'm just telling you what you already know. And what's that? What the fidelity wasn't exactly his strong point. Wasn't it? Oh, for Christ's sake, John, the very fact that he had an affair with you. Well, who else? I, I, I don't know. Who? No one. I'm, I'm sorry, it's not my place. I just didn't like the way he treated you. Both of you, that's all. You, you just can't carry on like that. This is the wrong time. We really shouldn't be talking about it. Even if he did, a bit on the side, what's it matter? It doesn't take anything away. What the fuck's it matter? But it does matter. What the hell was he playing at? It was so irresponsible. Even the vicar told me what a good fuck he was outside the crematorium. Oh, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to say that. The 
the West End run of My Night with Reg proved there was a mainstream audience for gay themes and subject matter, and that the public could identify with it whether gay or straight. Plot situations that might have been stale if the characters were heterosexual took on an air of the unexpected when the leading roles were gay. A case in point is Jonathan Harvey's beautiful thing, a straightforward coming-of-age love story that just happens to be about two boys. If I had written Beautiful Thing as um, a heterosexual play about boy and next door meeting the girl next door and, and falling in love, I don't think anyone would really have ever done it. Um, it what makes it different is it is two lads and the problems you face are, are very different to heterosexual problems. We might not necessarily all know the fear that you would go through about, you know, your parents finding out that you were gay because they might kick you out. It's about making those first tentative approaches, which we all have to do, whether gay or straight or bisexual or whatever. And it's also about a mother realising, not just the fact that her son's gay, but realising that he's of, a, of an age where he wants to be sexually active and he wants to be a grown-up and he wants to think for himself, and it's her coming to terms with that. A few people had a problem with the fact that she comes to terms with it so easily, but I don't actually think she does. I think she's struggling to maintain her pride through it all and won't come to terms with it for quite a long time. Some things I had to say. I know. I know that, Jamie. I'm not weird if that's what you're thinking. I know you're not, love. You think I'm too young? You think it's just a phase? You think I'm going to catch AIDS and everything? Oh, you know a lot about me, don't you? Jesus, you ought to go on that mastermind specialised subject, your mother. Don't cry. I'm not going to put you out like an empty bottle in the morning. Jeez, I thought you knew me well enough to know that. Why can't you talk to me, eh? Going behind me back like that, getting up to all sorts. There's me going to bed of a night feeling sorry for you because you had to share a bed with Steve and all the time you were... You're doing 70 minus one. What? Think about it. <laughs> Did you talk to him? My name's the same. Years of age, Jamie. What pearls of wisdom can he throw your way? He ain't seen life. He he's never even had a holiday. It's difficult, isn't it? Don't get me wrong. I like the lad. Always have. All I'm saying is, he's young. He's good to me. Is he? Yeah. Merchant Hive review of homosexuality, which involves, you know, which, which left me out. I didn't wear cricket whites and punt down a river, you know, and recite poetry to a boy with tousled or tousled, whatever you say, white blonde hair. I'd had a different experience than that, and I thought that understanding and acceptance and tolerance weren't just a middle class phenomena or an upper class phenomena. Beautiful thing played to audiences almost a hundred years after Oscar Wilde's imprisonment for homosexuality had sent gay men back into the shadows. Times have changed, and we've often rewound the clock. Now, gay playwrights are playing by the same rules as straight. The only crime the theatre won't permit is boredom. can at last be acknowledged is the contribution for so long neglected made to the theatre by gay men over the course of the last century and not merely in words.
there is another kind of drama where you can have a work which has no gay characters, no ostensible gay subject matter, and yet speaks absolutely and directly from the gay experience to the gay experience. Sometimes it can merely be the work of a costume designer or the work of a composer, i.e. the arts of theatre which are not about words. All theatre has a gay sensibility insofar that it's removed from the rules and the regulations the tied down cultural restraints we all live with. What gay culture has actually done is presented an alternative that mainstream culture, the dominant culture, um, not only needs, but actually desperately wants. People go to sit in darkened rooms of an evening to watch these fabulous footlit or spotlit creatures doing things and saying things that we would not normally do in the privacy of our own darkened rooms. And there they are, up there, screaming, carrying on, covered in makeup, all the things that we're not really supposed to do as respectable members of society. It's precisely where things get a little bit uncomfortable that you're probably going to raise the biggest laugh, create the greatest drama of the evening. Gay men have always known that not only is theatre a performance, life is a performance. They made magic out of this knowledge. Surrender to my 